Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Square Circle Podcast. I am your host, Marie Shadows. And on this episode of the Square Circle Podcast, I will be reviewing in full AEW Dynamite that debuted on October 14th, 2020. This was dubbed as the anniversary show of All Elite Wrestling. So let's talk about this match. What is the first thing that you notice? Cody Rose went back to being a blonde. Why? Why did he feel the need to go back to being a blonde? You know, he does not want to turn heel. He wants to remain the same baby face like he always was because he won the TNT championship back and he wants to be with the fans and want the fans admiration and wants their love. Dude, Ric Flair did not need to change his hair multiple times to let people know that he is still the dirtiest player in the game and get a polarizing effect when he came out. Ric Flair was one of the men who you either love them or hate them. The same thing with Triple H. Triple H also had that polarizing effect of you love him, you hate him, but this dude didn't really change hair colors as much as you do. And then also John Cena is a big example because those fans love Channing. Let's go Cena. Cena sucks. You know, that's a polarizing figure and he didn't have to change his hair color. The fact that you want to remain as a face does not improve your character growth, does not improve what we can see for year two of Cody Rhodes on the AEW Dynamite, on the AEW Dark, and on the AEW Pay-Per-View. Also, if you notice that on Twitter, Cody has said that he's going to get Orange Cassidy to lock up or something to that effect, right? Because Orange Cassidy never locks up in any of his matches whenever he does his character at all. However, in this match, they lock up. But the point I want to make is that if Cody is going to tweet out into the world that he's going to have Orange Cassidy lock up or like it was, it's a disrespect if you don't lock up or whatever the case was, I forgot exactly what it was, that's a heel move. When you have to go on Twitter to be like, hey, opponent, we're going to do something. I'm going to make you do something. That's sort of a little heelish, don't you think? A babyface wouldn't say that. A babyface wouldn't say, I'm going to make you do something. A babyface would be like, we're going to have a good match, Orange Cassidy. Other than that, Orange Cassidy showcases his technical prowess by doing a bunch of technical pins on Cody Rhodes. And then this is where it gets to be WWE-esque. So we know that the Dark Order right now is scrambling to try and keep Mr. Brody Lee happy because Mr. Brody Lee lost the TNT Championship to Cody Rhodes in a dog collar match. For some reason, the whole Dark Order members are on are in the crowd with the other wrestlers. And there's a spot that Cody, you know, goes over to the guardrail and you see them there and the referee is like, no, don't even get into it. And Arn comes in and pulls Cody away from what could be disastrous. And John Silver runs out, grabs the TNT belt, and acts like he's going to hit Cody over the head with it. However, Orange Cassidy takes away the belt from him, and then Orange Cassidy gives the belt to Arn Anderson. Why did all the members of the Dark Order have to be there? And they didn't really interfere, but the referee threw them out. And sent them to the back. They were just looking on. John Silver didn't even complete what he wanted to complete. But they got thrown out. But why did all members have to be there? You know what would have been smarter? What would have been smarter would be that. Brody Lee should have been the only person in the stands. And watch Cody from afar and not do anything. And play that psychological mind game to Cody by staring deep into his soul and staring at the match to get Cody unease. That would have set the tone for a better rivalry, for a better outcome, however you want to put it. But I think that Brody Lee being there by himself without the Dark Order members would have been best 
for this TNT Championship match or not have it completely? Like, are we still going to have the feud of Cody Rhodes and Brody Lee? So is Brody Lee going to win back the TNT Championship title to become two-time like Cody Rhodes? Like, I no longer know where this is going. In the beginning, with the open challenge matches, that was a very good idea. Well, let me get back to my notes. Cody starts working on Orange Cassidy's leg. Cody wrapped the leg over the rope. Reverse suplex, Orange Cassidy hits his knee. There is a diving DDT from Orange Cassidy to Cody. And then Cody puts the figure four leg lock on Orange Cassidy. There is a rope break. Orange Cassidy does the beach break on the apron to Cody from Orange Cassidy. And this is where the momentum should have shifted because the apron is the hardest part of the ring. However, time expired. Meaning that Cody Rhodes retained the championship title because the 20 minutes ran out. Why did we need that type of decision? Why did these men need to go the 20 minute distance when that extra time could have been saved to help out Big Swole versus Sheeta? Now everything on the card felt rushed because these guys went the distance. And they need to remember that 30 minutes of commercial takes up a lot of time when they do these shows. In my opinion, Orange Cassidy versus Cody Rhodes could have been way better than what it was. It needs to stop feeling like they're trapped in the WWE bubble where you know the Dark Order members are going to be out there. Well, they're out there to try to hurt Cody So that way, maybe Brody Lee can come in, swoop in, take the title back. But why is there no deeper story there? The Dark Order members could have watched from the stands, you know, taking notes so that way he could give to Mr. Brody Lee and be like, hey, these are his weak points. And then also the thing is that Cody just came off of a really brutal, great dog collar match from last week. And showed no signs of being hurt. And Orange Cassidy did not attack any hurt body part that Cody may have had. Like, I understand Orange Cassidy is not going to do underhanded tactics. But when you're in a championship match, you do what it takes for you to win the championship. It does not matter if people disagree with you and your antics. If you know Cody Rhodes was in a hellacious dog collar match... With Brody Lee, you attack those limbs. You make sure that he is hurting. So that way, when it's one, two, three, your hand is raising victory. Not go to the 20 minute time limit and tell a story that I don't even know what story they were telling. I really don't know. I don't know if Cody understands how to tell stories. He probably does. It's just that I haven't seen. His best. I have a love-hate relationship with Cody. Only because there's certain things that he does that he thinks it makes sense. But to me, when I'm looking at it and analyzing it and giving suggestions on how to improve, it just seems like oil and water. That it doesn't mix well. The other thing, too, is that at the end of this match, it was signed that Darby Allin gets a TNT championship title match. How and why? Why is Darby Allin getting a TNT championship title match? When are we going to revisit Scorpio Sky getting a push and hopefully getting the TNT championship title? Because Sky is nowhere near the eight-man singles tournament that determines the number one contender to face for the AEW World Heavyweight Championship title. So why is he not in the runnings for the TNT Championship title? Darby is great, okay? Nothing against Darby, but Darby is still in this story of protecting Will Hobbs from Team Taz, and then all of a sudden, Darby Allen gets a TNT Championship title match. Is Ricky Starks going to come out and have Darby lose at the expense of Ricky interfering? 
because Team Taz is like, we got to mess with this guy, so let's go mess up his match. I bet you that's not going to happen. But if someone listens to this podcast, maybe it might. There's just so many things wrong whenever Cody gets the spotlight and Cody thinks that what he's doing is great. And then when the fans say that the match was good, the match was great, oh, that was lovely. These are just the casual fans that you're catching that just look at wrestling to be entertained and be happy about. But for someone like me that has analyzed professional wrestling, that has experience in the business, and definitely has, you know, a resume that speaks for itself, I tend to want to better the business, want to better these guys by throwing out stuff that they've missed. And this is why they need a team, with me included, to make sure that they don't miss these vital little loose ends. So I really wish that... Cody can start evolving and not think every single fan is out to get him and not to think that I am out to get him or just want to tarnish everything and say these things. And if you really truly want to grow, there's information in this podcast that can help you think outside the box. All you need to do is just slide into my DMs if you want to talk about this. I am done talking about Cody Rhodes on AEW Dynamite for now. Let's head to the beginning of AEW Dynamite. AEW Dynamite opens up with FTR versus Best Friends. This is for the AEW World Tag Team Championships. FTR isolating half the ring, frequent tags, taking advantage of the referee rules to wear out Trent. Chuck Taylor hasn't been tagged in yet. Top rope back body drop from Cash to Trent. Trent got the knees up when Cash jumped down with a splash. Chuck with a hot tag. Chuck does a high-flying move outside the ring. Tully trips Chuck to have Dax cover Chuck. However, Chuck Taylor kicks out. Soul Food half-and-half connection. Then a knee to the face and Dax kicks out of all of that. Everyone hitting big spot moves quickly to gain a pinfall. Best friends do their finisher. However, Cash comes in for the save. If not, that would have been the end of it. Trent spears a fake arcade. They had a spot where Kip and Miro have been playing this fake arcade for the past two weeks, I want to say. And Trent spears it because either Dax or Cash had sidestepped them and they broke the most fakest arcade I've seen. Cash uses the belt to hit Chuck over the head. The referee had ducked down so he did not see anything and this is how FTR retains the AEW Tag Team Championships. And after the match, Kip and Miro are completely upset that the arcade got destroyed and take it out on best friends. And are we now going to have a feud between Miro and Kip versus best friends? Like, why? After that, Miro and Kip are in the ring. They cut a promo. Kip is completely mad. Miro is mad. And I'm like, you guys are trying way too hard. This team of Miro and Kip are trying way too hard to get themselves over just because they're a bunch of Twitch guys who are friends because they play Twitch. Doesn't make sense to form a tag team. And I'm not even counting the fact that Kip decided to have Miro as his best man to be in this wedding between him and Penelope. I just think that right now Kip is floating around. I don't think he understands what his character is. He's supposed to be the bad boy. He's supposed to be super bad. But lately, it just seems like he's floating there. And so is Penelope. Penelope seems like she's floating there. You know, she could have been 2019 breakout star of the year. But that's not the case. And also, Penelope's appeal has been way down. I thought that she was the whole package, and she probably still can be the whole package. However, her recent matches, especially on Dark, 
against Alex Gracia was really bad. For some reason, she likes to slow down the match so much that when she decides to speed it up, that's when mistakes happen. And that's where storytelling is not there. And that's where it looks sloppy. I'm not sure if she's content, but that's what it feels like. That she's content in her spot. And she's just there floating around with Kip. And it makes no sense. They can be a really awesome power couple if they allow them the time to develop and do it without so much kissing. So Miro and Kip have a tag team match against Sean Maluda and Lee Johnson. Lee Johnson is another one that's floating around and getting his dues in and working his way up from the bottom, but nothing too significant yet for him to be that breakout star that he could have been if maybe he joined the Dark Order. I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there. Sean Maluda is amazing. He's been in this business forever. He's part of the Samoan dynasty. I have a picture with him, and he's a very cool dude. He knows how to wrestle. It's just that you have to job out to Miro and Kip because they're the bigger stars, and Miro needs to calm down on him acting like a huge-ass brute when he's fighting smaller guys. He's not fighting the likes of Brian Cage, if he was fighting the likes of Brian Cage, he can be a brute all he wants. But if you're fighting smaller guys, just remember that they're smaller guys and they're not the same size as you with the same power as you. So calm that shit down and stop trying too hard to get your character over. This isn't WWE. WWE is not AEW. AEW is not WWE. You can be yourself. That doesn't mean you have to play the same old tropes that you were used to in another company. That's why sometimes it's not always good to go to a company right away. Even if you're, you know, 90 days free from your contract. If you're not going to evolve in a different company by playing a different character or trying something new, then wait a little bit longer and see what you really, really want to do. Now I'm seeing how. Miro is misusing himself just based on him being with Kip and them being angry about an arcade breaking. Like, I get it. You know, I'll be upset too if someone broke my arcade, but if it's a fake arcade that you guys have to fake play and is not hooked up, come on, don't freaking insult the intelligence of gamers out there. The other thing too is that Miro and Kip won this match. Miro did his Camel Clutch moved to Sean Maluda, almost missing this dude's neck, and picked up the victory. Next, we get a MJF and Inner Circle in-ring promo. Why? Why is MJF floating around now when he should be very adamant and angry that he lost to John Moxley? Why has his storyline been dropped with John Moxley? I don't know why. Eddie Kingston is not even in the rankings to try and face Moxie, but they're, they are reigniting their feuds from the past. And then you have Lance Archer, who's in the rankings, which makes sense to challenge for John Moxley. But then again, here goes MJF hovering around not being the best MJF that he can be. I understand that maybe Jericho wants to feud with the younger guys and Help them out, similar to how he was helping out Orange Cassidy, but I was not really enthused with that whole entire feud. It was just lacking, and I think that this is going to lack also. It's just not very interesting to me, and I remember I had said that on Twitter that it's not interesting to me, that I don't understand why this is happening, and I was told to just enjoy it. But sometimes in professional wrestling, you need logic to understand why two people are feuding and not just because back in 2019, they hugged and MJF congratulated Chris Jericho on becoming the AEW World Heavyweight Champion. Because when you're someone like MJF, who is great at being a heel, who has all eyes on him, and you go congratulate the champion, eventually that means... Keep it warm for me until I take it from you. That didn't happen in 2019. 
it didn't happen before and now they're crossing paths and he said that during this promo that he wants to join the inner circle however the inner circle members santana ortiz sammy did not like it hagger has no opinion because hagger is just the bodyguard that he's there to protect chris jericho but the inner circle members were not thrilled about it so let's play this out mjf comes into the inner circle gets added that does more harm for him than anything else are we gonna have the same played out stuff of that mgf interjects into the inner circle breaks them up from the inside out so that way these guys can eventually go on their own why would we have that how many times has that happened in professional wrestling that happens a lot and that's very predictable so they have this promo war going back and forth and the only way that MJF would be considered to be in the inner circle or be part of the inner circle is if next week on Dynamite, it is Chris Jericho versus MJF for a steak dinner, which I have no idea what that means. I really don't. Um, I don't even know if it's like a new insider term or anything like that. I guess it's just a regular steak dinner. I'm probably thinking way too much on it. But, yeah, why does this need to happen? MJF is a very good competitor for any title belt. If anything, he should be revitalizing his feud with Cody Rhodes so that way he could probably get the TNC Championship title. I don't know. I'm just throwing stuff out there. But, you see, this is where AEW sort of messed up by not giving MJF the title. The reason why sometimes I want titles to change often on wrestling programming is to keep it fresh. MJF had a really good story going and imagine the stories that he could have created in the land of AEW if he was world champion. He would definitely be the weasel we all know he could be. He would definitely be the great talker on the mic. It would be his land, it would be his dictatorship. And he'll be a heel as champion. Not to take anything away from Moxley. Moxley's biggest advantage is him being very adept and very knowledgeable in the ring. But when it comes time to telling stories, it's not there 100%. So right now I'm feeling that the AEW World Highway Championship title is getting a little stale with John Moxley as champion. If they would have gave it to MJF, it would have thrown everything upside down and more people would have had to work on their game to make sure that they can definitely take on MJF and definitely dethrone MJF and create stories. MJF can create a story. Him creating a story with Jericho makes no sense. It still does not make sense to me at all. If someone wants to outline how it makes sense to me, by all means, you can definitely reach me at Marie underscore shadows on Twitter or leave me a voicemail via anchor.com forward slash square circle podcast or over on the Patreon side, patreon.com forward slash rookie SCP. You know, I want to learn. I like learning in this business, but right now I see no point to have MJF versus Chris Jericho. After that, we get a Brit and Tony Schiavone segment. I miss these segments. These are my favorite segments. And yes, Britt Baker is completely 100% correct in her comment about if you want the AEW women's division to improve, ladies and gentlemen of the wrestling community, you guys really do need to watch the segments and not only just bash it online but also give suggestions on how to improve. There's a lot of tweets out there that I read of like, sign this person, sign that person. The more wrestlers you sign, how are they going to tell stories? Wrestling isn't only about signing the hottest personality out there. It's not only about signing the best wrestler out there. It's also making sure that the wrestler knows how to wrestle with the foundations of their training and also to tell stories. I want to be captivated by storytelling and not just professional wrestling. If you want that, go watch Stardom. I don't think Stardom has stories in their matches and also stories as well because they never really get talked about. All they get talked about is these two wrestlers are great. 
The Japanese wrestling is great. And this isn't me, like, knocking it. This is me not exploring enough of stardom and other women's wrestling where it's just straight out wrestling. I love professional wrestling. I love if matches are just straight wrestling sometimes. However, I need story with it too. And the only reason why I bring up stardom is because there's a lot of fans on Twitter and in wrestling that that always say that the Japanese women are better. But how are they better if they don't tell stories in the ring? You got to also tell stories while you're wrestling. Even if you're setting up your match and you're doing promos, you need to tell a story to carry the match for people to be interested in it and not just be there for, oh my God, it's another wrestling match. You know? So Britt is completely 100% right. If you want the women's division to evolve, you have to stop bashing it and start supporting it. And there are some positives and there's definitely a lot of negatives, but the more positives you focus on by providing solutions on how to fix things, then it works. If all you're going to do is be like, oh, well, the AW women's division sucks and everyone is green and this and that. Yes, everyone is green. However, if you listen to this podcast, I've given multiple solutions on how to fix the women in regards to building up their stories and rivalries with each other. I will not get into too much detail about that, but that is what needs to happen. So yes, I totally miss these segments of Britt Baker and Tony Schiavone. After that, we have a interesting segment with Matt Hardy. Matt Hardy is accompanied by his whole entire family at ringside and Tony Schiavone is interviewing him and Matt Hardy says that he is 100% to go in the ring to have some matches and then all of a sudden we get a Sammy promo where Sammy and Matt looks like they're going to be reviving their rivalry. I'm not sure how to feel about this. Hopefully the second time around it is safer. It is talked about more. It is not just let's do this spear. We've done it a million times but we overshot it. For something to happen. What I would like is that there is a nice ending to the Sammy and Matt Hardy feud. Do I think they need to feud? Not really. But let's see how creative they can get. Let's see how safe they can be. And let's support it rather than trying to cringe at it and automatically stop it right before it begins. Because it's definitely going to be a whole new ball game with probably both parties talking it out and making sure that whatever they plan is the most safest route and the most best for our entertainment you know that Matt Hardy can deliver on entertainment so can Sammy Guevara so I will be watching this feud to see how it goes but let's all be safe when we redo this please after that we get a segment this is to pick the four teams the four tag teams that will be competing for the number one contender spot to face FTR at full gear The first tag team announced is Private Party. The second tag team announced is John Silva and Alex Reynolds of the Dark Order. The next one is The Butcher and the Blade. And the last one are The Young Bucks. This was a very interesting segment. It was one of my favorites. I got excited for it. It was rushed due to Cody Rhodes and Orange Cassidy taking up 20 minutes in their match. But in this segment, the Young Bucks decide to super kick everybody and raise some hell and cause destruction during this segment. Next, we get our AEW Women's Title match, Hikaru Shida facing Big Swall. There was no build up to this match. I wish there was a build up. I wish that Big Swall would just turn on her camera and let her personality shine and let her shit talk every single person because that is what Big Swole gives to the wrestling community. She gives that feel that she's untouchable and that she knows what she's doing. She's a ring veteran and she'll definitely put you in your place if you overstep boundaries. I would like to see her just make promos and put it out online if she's facing Hikaru Shida and Shida to do the same. If Shida doesn't feel comfortable in speaking English to respond to Big Swole, speak in Japanese. Be the character that you're supposed to be. Hikaru Shida comes out as this samurai warrior. So therefore, do promos 
related to her being a samurai character that she's the best she has the title for a reason and this is why aew entrusted her to carry the company big swell could definitely go back and forth with hikaru shida on promos just put it out on the internet or put it up on the aw youtube page so that way there could be some type of hype behind this match that is what lance archer was doing with john moxley John Moxley was definitely not responding to Lance Archer, but Lance Archer, while he was recovering from COVID, unfortunately, was putting up some great content on Twitter that I liked and that I had retweeted and said that this is what wrestlers need to do. If you want to hype up a match and make sure that people watch and get interested, you do that. And that is how you evolve the women's division. The more content you put out there, women wrestlers, the more people will be attracted to you and more fans will gravitate towards you and be like, I want to support women's wrestling. Like, I truly want to support women's wrestling. Because there's a difference between people that say they want to support it, but don't know what the fuck they're talking about. And then they want to put down women and yet bring up women and support women, but bring them down and hold them back and a bunch of confusion. The internet is a very powerful tool with great power comes great responsibility. And I think that it could be utilized to hype up matches and to make sure that the fans know why they should tune into the AEW women's division. The fact that there was no backing, no hype to have this match and it was announced days before because usually AEW announces their women's matches either the day before or the day of, this match was announced way before, but there was no PR for it. This is why you guys need a PR rep. This is why you guys need someone on the inside to write about these matches, to give a preview of these matches, and to call up Big Swole and be like, hey, I need you to turn up Big Swole 100. So that way your promo can be seen by everybody and get people hyped And for people to tune in to watch women's wrestling. Hey, Sheeta, I need you to tune it up to 100 as well. I need you to be comfortable in whatever language you want to speak. To have the, maybe the Japanese audience come in and tune in. The Japanese American audience to tune in to a AW Dynamite. And watch you defend your championship. And be proud that Japan is represented in America. Like, these are things that they don't think about and they don't want to expand. I, they might want to expand, but they're not putting out the call to expand and to have people come in and be this passionate and be the supportive to a women's division that they care about. The AEW women's division has one of the best foundations, but right now it's still in shambles. It's piecing back its pieces together, but it's not doing it in the way that it should. And this is why it may sound like I'm either whining or just frustrated. It's the tiny things that matter in professional wrestling to make sure that all those naysayers shut up because that's all they do is talk negative while I'm here putting in the work to try to give ideas for how this match could have been better. And I'm going to keep saying it. And if no one likes it, that's totally fine. I am, I am true to myself. So what I saw during the Big Swole and Hikaru Shida match was that there's not enough communication. And I'm not sure if that's because it's still a language barrier between the two. But obviously, none of these women train together. None of these women decide to head down to the Nightmare Factory to train and have practice matches. The more practice matches you have, the better your match will be. The better your match will be well-received. When we had Thunder Rosa come in, it was great. I freaking love Thunder Rosa. She is a ring general. She knows what she's doing. Serena Deep, she knows what she's doing, and I love watching her wrestle with the other women. There are certain women that have a certain chemistry with each other that just works really well. Britt Baker, she came back from injury. She is smooth in the ring. 
Before, she wasn't as smooth in the ring. There were some mistakes here and there, but when she fought Red Velvet, that was, like, perfect. She is 100% she can go, and eventually she could carry the women's division. There's just little tiny things that the women's division just needs to pick up and rethink. Think outside the box, guys. Don't just sit there and be happy that you have this opportunity. Love it with all your heart, but also make sure you go 1,000 miles per hour to make sure that the division you love is at the forefront, is that we keep talking about it and not talk about it negatively, but talk about it positively. There was a point in this match where either somebody forgot to do something or there was just miscommunication and it looked like they couldn't do something on the fly to recover. The other thing, too, is that Big Swole was going to try for a sunset flip off of the um, rope, off of the top rope, and she slipped, and there was a mistake there. But Big Swole recovered with quickness to do something different, so that way it won't be talked about it as much. What I do have in my notes is that Big Swole does a cutter to Hikaru Shida onto the ramp, However, Sheeta comes in with her knee strikes, her finisher, and that is what allows Hikaru Shida to pick up the victory. There's a reason why I didn't write that much notes, only because I don't want to keep crapping on the women's division of AEW. There's ways to fix it, but no one is taking the time to do it, and this whole entire review might sound negative, but there's also positives to take away from it and to evolve and learn from it. I really want the women's division to be one of the best. And I want the women's division of AEW wrestling to rival that of Impact Wrestling. All they have to do is just talk with me. And it's that simple. Our main event is John Moxley versus Lance Archer. Throughout the whole entire night of the anniversary of Dynamite, Lance Archer and John Moxley was fighting all over the arena. Lance Archer attacking from behind, and they kept brawling. They, the agents in the back tried to defuse it, didn't work. So it turned into a no disqualification match, no count outs, nothing like that. And once they got into the ring, they fought all over the arena again they use multiple weapons they use lots of chairs and they redid their spot at wrestle kingdom 14 where lance archer put john moxley through the table and this time around it was the opposite effect i hope i'm right but it was a bunch of carnage and chaos and unfortunately lance archer did not pick up the victory to become the new AEW world heavyweight champion John Moxley retained when he did the paradigm shift to Lance Archer. After that, Eddie Kingston comes out. Eddie Kingston celebrates with John Moxley, talks about their past rivalries and all this stuff. The Lucha Bros is there too. And then eventually, Eddie Kingston attacks John Moxley. And he basically chokes out John Moxley to prove his point. And eventually, they're probably going to start this whole feud of him and Moxley for the AEW World Heavyweight Championship title at full gear. It's probably going to end up being a full gear. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is my notes. This podcast has been very long, but I am very passionate about helping to improve the business. And you know how you can help me improve the business, ladies and gentlemen. If you enjoyed, this podcast, please go over to anchor.fm forward slash square circle podcast to listen to this podcast episode. Please make sure to share it. And if you are on Twitter, please make sure to follow me at Marie underscore shadows to retweet myself. So that way AEW and Tony Khan knows that I am serious about helping them improve the tiny details that they are missing, the tiny details that I can see, and those loose ends can definitely get tied together. 
I enjoy what I do. I love what I do. You can hear the passion in my voice. So do not deny me the opportunity of just simple support. I'm not even asking you to join my patreon.com forward slash rookie SCP. If you guys want to go check that out, go ahead, go over there and support on your own will. But free support, free word of mouth. That's all I want. Ladies and gentlemen, again, I am Marie Shadows on the Square Circle Podcast. I care desperately and wholeheartedly about the wrestling industry. I love this through and through. This is my bread and butter. I love it so much. And I want to thank each and every one of you for tuning in to the Square Circle Podcast, listening to me rant about professional wrestling and matches and how to fix it and all that. And I would not be here without you guys. October 19th is the one year anniversary of the Square Circle podcast. So me and AEW has that in common. Thank you guys from around the world for listening to the Square Circle podcast. This was my review of AEW Dynamite. And I'll see you guys in the next one.